All right, welcome back to another episode of If They Won't Listen. This is space made with a, made in a Hollywood basement, and beaming aboard is my captain. Whoa, Captain Spencer here. How you doing? <laughs> That's. <laughs> Where is my lieutenant? That's... Where's my right hand person? I can do the whole like Riker thing where I have like my like knee up all the time while I just. Oh my gosh! The- <laughs> can we just do the rest of the show in that position? <laughs> where you can't see my face, you just see my knee. You just see part of my leg in the shot. <laughs> and that awesome T-shirt. Oh yeah. <laughs> my 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 slime girls T-shirt, man. Hell yeah. Um, what's um, uh, what's what's that all about? I'm not familiar. They, it is a uh, it's a musical act that's uh, that is in the genre of chiptune rock. Mm-hmm. So have you ever listened to chiptune before? No, I'm from the 23rd century. I don't okay, <laughs> so chiptune rock is 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 a genre of music where um, the the music sounds as if it came from a video game from the from the 90s. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Oh, it's really good stuff. I mean, uh, a lot of these guys will, you know, take Nintendos or Game Boy Advance. And yeah. then what they do is they they just like they root it into their into like their keyboards and stuff or, you know, you know, they somehow like hack it together with their amplifiers. So when they play guitar, they'll play their keyboard or whatever. It comes up sounding like uh, as if it came from a Nintendo game. That's pretty awesome. I it's remember really as a, when I was a kid, I had a Super Nintendo. Like, I got it one year for Christmas, all right? Right. That, just to give you an idea how old I am. Right. And <laughs> I got this Nintendo in 1992. <laughs> Super Nintendo. Super Nintendo. <laughs> um, and it had this game where I forgot what it was called, but it was like, uh, it was Mario's, like, creativity. And it was like, you could either make Mario Paint or make a yeah but they had paint but you could also make music through it too i think yes you can and yeah and it had the sheets and and like you had to know music to play that part of the game because like i tried doing like my own little things of like you know twinkle twinkle little star like not mozart stuff but like even the basics and i was just like why are not these sounds working duh i can't figure it out star i thought if i just put a whole bunch of stars in there it would just magically play twinkle twinkle little star (laughs) but apparently i needed some other little icons to figure that out anyway enough about that boring game are you are you setting to stun here are you going to stun us with your words tonight yeah totally (laughs) yeah (laughs) I just got the sound. I'm just on a on a website to get all this, uh, you know, all these uh, Star Trek sounds, and just I'm just having fun with it. There you you stop showing me your phone's ass. Yeah, yeah look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Looking sexy, isn't it? That oh, black, that dark, that dark backside of it. I don't know. I'd rather go back to that new shot. <laughs> all right. What all are right. we ta- What are we talking about, Captain Spencer? We are talking about Star Trek, number four, The Voyage Home. Oh, baby. Leah, what are your two cents on this film? All right, so let's start off with the synopsis. I mean, if you want to know how I felt about the movie, I liked it. But <laughs> All, right. All right, All right. let's get into the. I think it's your, your turn to do the synopsis. Oh, yeah, yeah. So... Shortly after the revival at Spock, the crew is in exile until they decide to face uh, face their guilt of what they uh, what they did in the previous film. They come back. They come back home. But the voyage home on Earth is set that is uh, in terrible danger of a of a space probe that's calling to what is now an extinct an extinct ant species. They travel back in time to an old time to retrieve that animal to translate and respond to the alien message. So automatically, I would write that off as like a pass if somebody was to describe that to me. I'd just be like, ah, I think I'll skip this one. <laughs> you really have to, 
you uh you definitely have to be in a in a certain headspace to be told okay so in this one they're going to rescue whales to yeah. communicate to an alien space probe and then people would look at you and go huh okay can we just watch terminator <laughs> No, no, dudes, I'm telling you, it's really good. You have to, what you, get, what you really need to understand is that in the premise of Star Trek, <laughs> what happens is that Captain Kirk with Spock and everybody else, it, 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 like, you just got to get through it. It's a really good story, man, I'm telling you. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, it's basically how somebody would probably sell it to me. I, I, I mean, regardless, it's like, I'm glad, like, when I first watched this film, I had no idea what was going on. I was just like, I think one day Netflix had the whole thing, and I was like, yeah, I got nothing to do. And I guess started going through it, and then I'm like, the fourth one, didn't even read the synopsis. I was like, let's go. Who they got as a villain this time around? And then I'm like, whales? We're talking about whales here? <laughs> gotta go I'm to like, see- all right, let's roll with this shit. Let me grab my ball. <laughs> going to San Fran in 85. <laughs> to rescue whales it's fantastic yes <laughs> all right well although at the time of its release it would have been considered modern day right <laughs> right modern day san fran <laughs> this movie uh let's see this movie came out written it was writ- it was uh directed by leonard nimoy once again harv bennett was brought on to uh the story was by harv bennett and leonard nimoy the screenplay was by Steve Mearson and Peter Krex. And I look those two cats up. Yeah, tell me. And um, let me see. They didn't do and they oh yeah, that's right. They didn't do much else. They they looks like they just got what they got and that was it. So both of these guys, Peter Krex and Steve Me- and Steve Mearson, here's mm-hmm. the only four movies they ever, ever done, and they did them together which was Star Trek, The Voyage mm-hmm. Home, Back to the Beach, Double Impact, and finally, Anna and the King in 1999. Wait, they did Double Impact. They did Morgan Double Impact. Freeman vi- movie. And then... Jean-Claude Van Damme, what are you talking about? Was Morgan Freeman in it? Oh, I was thinking about Deep Impact, actually. <laughs> you were thinking about Deep Impact. Double Impact. Wait, that's what was Jean-Claude Van Damme and... Uh... Dennis Fighting Rodman? Jean-Claude Van Damme. That's like the, the greatest movie ever made. Came out in 1991. I don't know. What about Bloodsport? Oh, it's so, such a great movie. I know. Anyway, anyway. All right. And then they did uh, Jodie Foster's Anna and the King. Yep. That's the only thing. These guys are only actor from 86 to 99, and they did nothing else after that. There's not much, like... there's not much yeah. in terms of their biography. That was it. It seems like they're more script doctors than anything else. You know who if else? They is- only did four screenplays. They were like, "Yeah, we could do this. We got something." And then the rest of the time, they're just like, "What do you got for me to work on? Let's do it." I, you know, they they must have just got their money and got out, and then said they must have something must have. I'm like really curious to know what happened to these guys and like what was their decision to get out of movies after four movies in a span of 13 years. It's, a, it's curious. It's curious. It's very curious. Okay, and then also who also wrote the screenplay was Nicholas Meyer, brought back to work to finish the screenplay. That makes sense because you could tell he adds the touches of like the companionship, the dialogue of the crew. Yeah, yeah, it really shows, and it really he wrote mostly the parts that happened before and after the main parts where they're back in modern day san fran yeah, yeah, yeah okay he wrote the we part- don't call it 85 san fran I, I i just meant like it's funny for the time of its release it yeah was modern day it was modern, modern day. day yeah reprising their roles as always is the original cast of the original series which includes obviously shatner nimoy kelly duhan takai kenning and nick and uh nichols uh cinematography was done by donald peterman edited by peter e berger Music by not James Horner. No, he was doing another movie at that time. They got you know what he was doing. Oh, I just, I just, um, Aliens. That's right. That's did, right. Which came out the same year as, as, uh, as this, as Voyage Home. Voyage and, Home. Yeah. 
and uh, Leonard and Leonard's uh, Rosam- uh, Rosamond also um, composed the animated Lord of the Rings movies, mm-hmm. Beneath the Planet of the Aids, and Barry Lyndon. That's some of his stuff. Oh, yeah, of course. Rebel Without a Cost in East of Eden. That's interesting. Yep. I got to be honest, I wasn't too thrilled with the stuff, but nonetheless, nonetheless, I'm sure for the films that you mentioned, like he does have those, some of those memorable scores. Uh, yeah, he did the score for Robot Cop 2, Sylvia, Cross Creek, City in Fear, Promises in the Dark. Oh, wow. Yeah, they. You and... know what Donald Peters, Peterman did? The director of photography, the cinematographer? Oh, yeah, I brought that up too. He's you got a see? flash dance. Get shorty and yep. the men in black underneath his belt. I know. That's insane. Like those are like all like excluding like men in black because like that is sci-fi to an element, but like the yeah, other two cocoon. cocoon, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, true. I mean, he's yeah. got he's got some gems underneath his belt. Like you don't realize what he's done, but you're like, oh, I've seen a lot of his work. Yep. <laughs> you don't really, you know, it's funny because you don't realize how much these guys uh, were working on some of your favorite films that helped, you know, that just helped it just by that much to make it better and make it much more memorable. So and, and case in point is Peter E. Berger, who did who edited films such as Mommy Dearest, Fatal Attraction, Coach Carter, and oh, I just had it. I lost it. Damn it. You ended us off with Coach Carter. I know. I ended us off with Coach Carter. I'm so sorry. My fucking bad oh and it's and, okay i've never seen the film oh wait wait bring it back less than zero and hocus pocus oh i love less than zero and hocus pocus you know good movies in their own right good movies yes. in their own. and then did you, did you grow up as a hocus pocus fan oh hell yeah baby heard that, heard that, heard now they got the sequel coming out i'm like all right you know we'll see what you know we'll see we'll see bring it so i don't really have in terms of um okay yeah so this Fun movie facts. came out in November 26, 1986. And then I decided, because we, we don't really have a lot in terms of more actors or, 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 or who else. Because Robert Fletcher reprises his role. They have this, they, they have, IL, for, for the costumes, they have ILM doing the special effects. They brought in some people to do the CGI. And it's, it's all really good, but it's people they've worked with before that we've, that we've talked about. Mm. But I wanted to bring up, other films that came out in 86 and these are all the top grossing movies star trek 4 comes in number five out of 10 mm-hmm. here are the other ones starting at number 10 ferris bueller's day off ruthless mm-hmm. people the golden child aliens back to school oh ronnie dangerfield yeah such a good movie so good so good but all the stuff that he says in that movie would not stand out the karate kid part do I mean, two, Platoon, Crocodile Dundee, and then do you want to guess what the number one movie was in 1986 in the U.S.? Top Gun. You nailed it, bro. Yeah. Tom and you Cruise, want to hear something about Kill five me, out of those ten? You know what? You know what five out of those ten films have in common? They were all made by Paramount. Fuck yeah. Yeah, Top Talk Gun. Talk about a good year. Top Gun, <laughs> Crocodile Dundee, Star Trek. Yeah, Golden yeah. Child. Yeah, yeah. And then other movies that came out like uh, that year. Yeah, it, it, you know, 1986 had some really good movies come out. I was actually looking at it going, that's, I'm like, damn. It is quite dope. Like, I love it. It's just like, you could go, like, I know this, I've seen it, I've seen this. And then it's like one you're like, I meant to see that, but I know it's good, or I've heard <laughs> it's good. Stand By Me came out that year as well. Oh, I love that movie. Emma's War. Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer, Running Scared. That's a good flick. Running yeah. Sca- oh, Running Scared with uh, Billy Crystal. And, yes. Uh, Space Camp with Joaquin Phoenix. Space Camp. That's interesting. Eight Million Ways to Die, Nine and a Half Weeks, also came out that year. Nine and a Half Weeks is insane. Oh, my God. Yeah, there's a April Fool's Day, which is a horror movie. Armed and Dangerous. Have you ever seen April Fool's Day? No, I haven't. Big Trouble in Little China also came out that year, which is just a fucking great movie. John Carpenter, how can you go wrong? I know, seriously. Blue Velvet also came out that year. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of great movies that came out in 1986. You know what else happened in 1986? What? I was born. You know what? (laughs) 
So was I. Hey. Hey. <laughs> what, what, uh, what's your birthday? I don't want to talk about it. All right. When's the bump? <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Oh, man. You're that. Don't worry. You're not getting. Oh, the fly out. also came out in 86. Look at that. Oh, my goodness. How did I forget I that? Fly. Flight of the Navigator also came out. So, like, lots of great movies came out in 86. And you and I were both born. So, that's how you know it was a great fucking year. Indeed. (laughs) And so, we move on to, finally, actresses, which the only ones that can really talk about is Catherine Catherine Hicks, who plays the the doctor. And and Tony Curtis. Or Robin Curtis. Yeah, but she was very brief. But we already know about her. We already talked about her. You know? We know about it, but I, yeah, yeah. I, I guess when we go through the whole film run, we'll, we'll discuss about it. Yeah, that you sure. know, we'll, get, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But yeah, so now, the seventh heaventh parents managed to be in Star Trek movies. I know, that was points. really funny. I noticed that too. <laughs> I went, oh my. I was like, oh my goodness. But she's wow. also the mom from like Child's Play, also. Like, yes, she is, and yes, she is. She was the mom from the original Child's Play, which and she was she was good in that. Oh, she was fantastic. Like she, she, she's a good actress, like a really good B actress, but like nothing you would ever be like, yeah, let's give her the big pops. Like, no, it was just like put her in something, and she's got a great chemistry with people. She's yeah, I thought she played very well with. Um, that whole scene when we get to it with Spock and Kirk, she was just fantastic. Mm. She did very well standing, standing toe to toe with them. And I thought, I thought it was fantastic. So this movie was budgeted for 21 millions and box office, $133 million. That's a profit. That is definitely a profit. It was considered a box office success that year. And if you do the math, if you do the quick maths on that, that's mm-hmm. more than six times what it was budgeted for, considering it the more successful of the film fr- of the four films so far. Well, yeah, I mean, they kept raising the ante and people just kept coming back because they were that pleased. Yeah. I, I mean, mean it makes a lot of sense. And that's a big jump of budget because what, what did you say last time? The search for Spock was 15 million? The search for Spock was 15 million dollars. Yeah. No, 16 one, million. 16. And this is what, 22, 23? This one was 21, so it had an extra five million uh, an extra five million dollars to work with. That's something. A lot of it came from uh, with the production. What one of the things that came with it is that Kirk and, and Nimoy took a s- slight pay decrease. However, the rest of the cast reprising their roles asked for an, uh, an up. Yeah, they asked for they asked for a, an increase in their pay. And because of that, that actually made Paramount consider making a next generation. Yeah, to lower down the budget and start from scratch again. Exactly. So to get more act to get actors that are just not exactly the most known at the moment and yeah. start all and start it all over again. So this is what inspired them to have and they gave Gene Roddenberry something to do. Yeah, they really caught him out of the office. So like, all right, well, we'll let you play with your toys again. And he's just like, all right, I got this. I've been cooked up there for so long, I actually got something. I know, right? That, that, I guess that was the amount of time he needed to create a whole new Star Trek. Absolutely. And this, and this is the final movie before the series begins, the TNG series. Right, because this came out in 86, in, one, in less than a year after that, which TNG comes, TNG, The Next Generation came out. So this movie premiered in... November 1986 and then Star Trek The Next Generation I had it up in front of me there it is that premiered in September 1987 so almost a year yeah, yeah. almost Good. not only that I was like what that's uh nine ten months ten months ten months difference so in ten months later you had a whole new Star Trek which of course was writing was almost writing off of the success of the film so everyone was probably all excited back then going oh my god another star trek i'm so excited i have to go watch the movie show a new show i don't know how people sounded like back then okay <laughs> we just watched the movie on it by the way <laughs> they say damn you and double damn you <laughs> double damn you 
Uh, I can't get the plugs in. <laughs> and, <laughs> so Star Trek was uh Star Trek at this in this really in the mid decade was riding a really nice high. Mm. And so once again, they were giving Nimoy and Harv Bennett a little bit more direction. And Nimoy had envisioned making the movie a little bit more of a lighthearted with no central clear cut central villain. Only just a situation that the Enterprise, the, only the crew of the Enterprise can handle, which at first uh, Paramount didn't like. Yeah, but once they saw the budget of buying everybody back, they're like, eh, yeah, this isn't a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, and so they were always playing around with this idea of, of time travel, and then Nimoy, who was at, who is a was really big in environmentalism wanted mm. something that would bring a message across as well whether uh one of the things that he was throwing around was like the rainforest and then he just decided to go with humpback whale so i did a little bit of a deep dive on whaling mm. industry which is hardcore in by the 80s the humpback whale population was less than 10 percent. what's it at today it's back to about eight it's back to eighty eight thousand is what they counted last. Oh, uh, so what's that like? 30%? A little bit. Maybe oh. I, I couldn't. I, I maybe I don't know. What to, I couldn't really tell you what the percentages, but the whaling industry is still going on, but it's not as hard as harsh as it was back in the eighties when everyone was really doing it. And and there, you remember, there's that one scene when they're in the in the Cetacean Institute and. They show all that footage. Mm -hmm. That was some raw footage, bro. It was. Right. It was. It, gave, it, it was probably the rawest you ever seen in a Star Trek. Right. And, you know, the funny thing is this, with, the, you know, with the script, they didn't really like the uh, producers, executives didn't really like this idea, but they really, and Nimoy really wanted Eddie Murphy. Well, Eddie Murphy said that he wanted to be really, in a Star Trek movie. And they were really considering him for the role, but he didn't like the whole premise of the film. And so he went off and did The Golden Child instead. Which was, which was actually a failure on his part. Because The Golden Child did not do well at the box office. It, Guaranteed, not, he still did well in the 80s. Like, it didn't really hurt his career for the oh, rest no, of that it, decade. But, like, it's not his most financially successful one. No, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting movie it wasn't it wasn't great it no. wasn't wasn't great at all but you know uh but it was easy for paramount because they're like oh dude we got this guy signed up to like 10 pitches like right we can knock one off and give him a star trek film like why not yeah but <laughs> but it's smart on eddie murphy's like he's just like yeah this doesn't look like my game <laughs> yeah it, i think what's really what i think is what's really interesting is that you know when they initially had an issue with the script, uh, the 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 producers and they they were they brought back Nicholas Meyer who was a little bit more, um, a little healed up from the Wrath of Khan disagreements. You know he came back in and he and he wrote and he wrote uh, he added to his little treatment of the script and it came out a lot better. A lot of people found it a lot that the executives found it a lot better. But you got to think about it; they were dealing with. A number of movies, including Top Gun, Top Gun, Golden Child, and Crocodile Dundee. So they already had their hands in the pot with a lot of other movies. Oh yeah, they did. <laughs> so they some knew point, what they were doing. They knew what they were doing. They just said, I believe, I believe Don Simpson was actually the executive at Paramount at the time. Don Steele, who was Don Steele, first, okay, who was the first female head of production in Hollywood. Is that right? Yep, that's that's her fun fact. She's incredible. W yeah, was an American. She's got amazing taste. She was one of the first women to run a major Hollywood studio. Oh, that's incredible. I love that. I love that. I I want to seek more of the stuff she produced. Then. Oh yeah, she did Flashdance. She produced Top Gun, Fatal Attraction, City of Angels. Oh my gosh, she did Angus. I love that movie. Cool. Angus Runnings. is great. Cool Runnings, Honey, I Blew Up the Kid, and Sister Act 2. Back in the Habit. Uh, 
Sister Act 2 is a fun film. Also, another Star Trek player. Oh, yeah, that's right. Guinan. Yeah. Guinan, that's right. All right. And so that kind of, you know, production, uh, other things that uh, filming began, I think, what was it, April of 1986? And they got a lot of the principal photography done within a few months. Once again, they... They were able to shoot a lot of the a lot of the photography. Oh no, it was in February twenty fourth. So they got a lot of it done in, in, in a few months of shooting. Like they did ten days in San Francisco, and they had their days over at uh on this on the studio set, and where they had to shoot all the all those scenes on on the studio. And this is the first Star Trek that was shot on location because they had to make it feel like it was had to make it seem they were there in San Francisco. Yeah, no, it's impressive what they shot within 10 days, too. Yeah. <laughs> like, it really is, because if you think about how much you actually see, it kind of takes up like a second act. Mm-hmm. And you see, like, the second act, like, filmed in 10 days. It's like, oh, wow, they, they, you know, time management was really a time management, and they made it work to, like, the best of their abilities, it appears like. Nemo is a good director. He knows how to, he, he literally knows how to run a, sh- he really knows how to run a ship, metaphorically speaking. He does. He knows how to play into everyone's best interests, like, like what they're best at acting as and let them dig into it. But again, I think he grows a lot from this previous film. Like mm-hmm. in the search for Spock, it's a lot of close ups and face, face work, like facial reactions. In this one, you still get the close ups. But he does some great job with the wide shots. Right. Like, he's got some nice, sick, like, little wide shot scenes that are just like, oh, like, kudos to you, sir. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, there wasn't a lot of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There wasn't a lot of that. You're right. There wasn't a lot of those tight close-up, you know, nice, well-distant shots. And some of them were those, like, medium shots, yeah. long shots. But, like, nothing that was, like, too artsy about it either. He made it, like, really flow properly. In fact, I think the pacing of this film is probably better than the previous one. I, I, yeah, I, I have, I, I agree. I agree. And I think a lot of it happens to stand from the fact that the narrative frame of this movie is the space probe that first comes in that yeah. disables space stations that's got this uh that's messing with the with the weather on earth causing torrential tumultuous storms and you have that and then of course when they come back at the end of the film to save the to save the day you know those are those those are those like really two major scenes where everything in the middle is everything that happens in san francisco with everyone's with everyone splitting up into teams doing their separate their separate thread of the story yes and i enjoy that you got to see people paired off and you get their own screen time i think that's something that uh larry nimoy does really well out of the directors we've seen thus far right and you really and and that was something you saw with the movie before that too as well with the search for spock but you really see it a lot more and i think that's one of the reasons i think that's why this movie I really enjoyed a lot is because since he went with a more, you know, not as intense situation, very lighthearted kind of tone, he was able to yeah, have these, uh, have the, have his, his castmates really demonstrate a little bit more acting chops in, 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 a, in a lot of scenes. And it's one of the things I really enjoyed about this movie, especially, especially the scene with Dr. McCoy and then the scenes with, Oh um, yeah. With Dr. McCoy and then that one scene with him and Scotty at the plastic. So that was... Yeah, McCoy, yeah him and Scotty at the computer. Uh- <laughs> computer? <laughs> computer? Computer? <laughs> computer? <laughs> I watched What's this... Up? Wait, yeah, go wait, ahead. I- one thing I want to say about Nimoy, I, I think the transition it took to get that lighthearted needed to be filled in with the cap of Search of Spock because Search of Spock was coming off the hangover, the intensity of Wrath of Khan. Mm. And then it was kind of like getting over that and then working into its way into a lighter kind of 
mood and feel. And I think that's why they probably brought on the Klingons because they're like I said before in the previous episode, they're like pirates in a way. Like you know they're bad, but like there's not an, that's all you need to know. Like you don't need to have a history behind it to understand why they're bad. And right. with this, and with this, it's completely lighthearted where there is no villain. I mean, there's an object that's you know threatening Earth. And ships and yeah. stuff like that, but by no means is it like doing anything where it's it's. I mean, essentially, there's no fatalities from this villain. Yeah, it's just a very very intense situation where there's these very strong torrential storms and winds that are just happening, and that's and then in that and that's where the real tension comes in is, is is the is the fear of the of the unknown if this thing doesn't get a response back yes yes and that and that was enough to accelerate the film that was enough for a plot and i thought i you, you know you know this movie sometimes a lot there's people who say they can't recommend it there's people that say they liked it but they can't recommend it and there's people who just don't think it's that good of a movie. And I think it's a fantastic film because the, the creative challenge that comes with, all right, we're going to make a movie that has no central villain. Is this going to be a situation? Mm. And it's going to be a little comedic because let's face it, it's, it's going to be very, it's going to be pretty comedic. And it's pulled off very well. Yes. Yes, and there's a lot of hands at play, and I really think that the cinematography has a lot to lend to it because it adds such realism into what's going on. Yeah, you know, well, like good example. Yeah, go, yeah, go. No, no, go, go. Well, you know, one of the things that you really see when when they're walking down the street and they pull back a little bit, so you can kind of you so you can see things that are happening in the background and on the foreground while they're walking on the sidewalk of the San Francisco of the San Francisco street. And that, you know, that really just shows that, like, that, 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 that focal point that you really, it, it just, it was a very well shot, just like a nice little well shot. What do they call that? A walkabout or a walk around uh, scene where they, it's a, a walk and talk. They do, walk the walk and talk. And, they do the walk and talk. Right. And I thought that that was just brilliant cinematography. And then, of course, a lot of the lighting was so well done. Yeah, certain- a lot, especially in the beginning. Mm-hmm. When you see when you see the Klingons ask for Kirk's head, mm-hmm. and yeah. they're just like and and like I like it's a great scene, but at the same time, it's like if you just see everything that's going on, the set pieces, the lighting, the way the dark, how the darkness is really going, it's like it just has such a beautiful fluid motion to it, but it doesn't make you think. It doesn't make you think that it's like almost too plasticky at the same time. Like it just gives an element of realism to it where you feel like, yes, this is a place I could actually be as opposed to a place like, like watching a Marvel movie. They're very clean and slick. And I feel like they have this way of feeling about themselves, especially in the intergalactic stuff where it feels, I mean, it's not, none of this stuff is real, but it doesn't have that layer of like, I feel like when they are in space, I feel like I'm in space with them. It's just like, no, this is just like another you know, this is something that's CGI, as opposed to this, where it was just a lot of mm-hmm. bad paintings and stuff like that. And then, like, but but to me, it just it, it had a layer of realism to it that that I felt like wasn't touched upon as much as in the previous films. Yeah, I I, I get what you're saying. And then um, that opening scene when we kind of it kind of just picks up where they left off in the last movie, where it's been three months since. The search. Wait, are we Spock. gonna ex- are we gonna skip over the the challenger? The dedication to the challenger. Yeah. Yeah, they dedicated this film to the challenger, which had exploded four months prior to the movie's release. I think that was no. I'm sorry, way way longer than that, because it was just at was it? It was I think it was the challenger. It was just after I was born is when it blew up. Oh, word. Let me let me look that up really quick. What, was it? Did it wasn't it in May it happened? I feel so it, bad for not knowing the actual answer. <laughs> You're fine, Ugh. dude. Uh, like a bad historian. Its last flight was in January twenty, January nineteen eighty six. Yeah, the Challenger space shuttle. Yep. So January nineteen eighty six. 
that's what that's what it says his last flight was but i don't know if that's exactly the the actual disaster itself that's just its last flight and nearly not much here hold on let's see I forgot, but some cable company or, or at least like Netflix of some sorts or maybe Amazon did like a whole special series. On you're right. It was it was January. It was in January 1986. So yeah. you're talking about 10 months, 10, 11 months after the fact this thing blew up. They yeah. did a whole dedic- They did a, a quick dedication. It was more than I, I, it was a quick dedication, but at the same time, I found it so... It was interesting to me how it was set up before the actual logo of the film company. Yeah, they really gave it. Yeah, I see what you're saying. They really gave them their screen time. Yes, they were like, Did we, first, this needs to be mentioned before anything else happens. And like, it starts the film in a very somber tone, but like, it, it just starts it off with a somber tone. But at the same time, like, I do appreciate what they did for for the people who lost their lives on the challenger like that that was a very only star trek was the film to do that right yeah yeah i I didn't think about that that's yeah star trek is just (laughs) star trek is just a very classy franchise that's a great word for it It it's a very classy (laughs) very classy sir (laughs) all right cool so and then after that introduction or that um, dedication, we go yeah. into the we go into the the first part of the movie, which is three months after the search for Spock, where the Klingons are demanding retribution for the actions of one Admiral James T. Kirk and the crew of the Enterprise as they hijacked their ship, and the crew has been on exile since then. Who are going to man up and face their charges? The one thing they don't do is they don't explain what happened to those Klingons that were on the ship with them. I had to use some imagination and probably believe that they sent them on their merry way on another shuttle. It's the only thing it, I could think of. Speaking of imagination, a long to go with the clowns because I felt like you. I was like, wait, where's that? What happened to that one person? But I was like, did Kirk ever tell his, uh, you know, special lady friend that, you know, their son died? And like, if so, how did that go? Oh my god, yeah, you're right. They didn't even bring that up the entire film. You're very no, but they can they can mention uh Savik being like, hey, I want to tell you something three months later that your son fought an honorable death. Like, honey, why didn't you tell me that three months ago? Like that could have given me a little bit of uh, uh assurance in my life. That could that could have given me a little bit less sorrow to think of. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. wow. Sometimes you think too deep about these films. No, that's it's a, it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, and so that's the yeah. other thing. Um, one of the one of the unused scenes in this movie that was in the novelization of the movie was the fact that Savik stays behind yeah. because she's pregnant. With Spock's baby. With Spock's From baby. Search is Spock. The which you talked we about. All saw. Which you talked about, you mentioned that they technically were having sex with the whole hand feeling thing. I'm like, is that how is that how Vulcan sex works? You just touch hands, and that's. I mean, I remember that as an episode in, in Futurama. That's a, hey, that's the logical way to do it. Fair enough. If you don't, you don't, you don't match genitals. You just touch fingers and hands, and that's it. God's doing oh. his work. God do yeah. his work afterwards. I wonder what the Vulcan god is. Like, what's the name of the Vulcan god? Oh, my. Is there, let's look it up. Fuck it. Okay, we got time. Yeah. The Vulcan. I'm just going to type in the Vulcan god. What's their theology? What? What is it? What is their theism like? Oh, my God. That's going to be like a whole other hour right there. I feel like. Right? Because <laughs> I feel like. The dedication towards Klingons and Vulcans of like the history and the language uh-huh. and the and the vocabulary of it all is just like something only. We, we, it would be an encyclopedia upon itself. If you have yeah. So Vulcan mythology, Vulcan mythology before the time of the awakening, time of awakening, mm-hmm. including a number of go- uh, different gods. So they are very much a Pathian. 
uh, they have a pantheon of gods. They're very pantheist. God of war, god of death, god, and god of peace. Typically, That's god awesome. of war. Yeah, are depicted on artifacts on the stone of Gaul. There you go. And they're separated from the god of uh, god of peace. And that makes sense. Shakiri is the name of one of the gods. So there you go, buddy. Interesting, interesting. So yep. all right, so they so they're like, hey, we're gonna go back to face the crimes. You'll stay here, you you know, do your thing. We don't want you to be a part of our crime making thing. You still have a long journey of like Starfleet ahead of you, so we'll just pause you here. Well, she had nothing to do with it. I mean, she her and Spock had nothing to do with uh Kirk and the Enterprise and the Enterprise crew going rogue. No you know, a little renegade, a little maverick, if you will. Hijacking, hijacking a decommissioned spaceship. All right, nice man. Sabotaging the Excelsior. Ah, disobeying high-ranking admiral's orders, sir. Come on, these are these arrest these are arrestable offenses. They are arrestable offenses, but you know, you, listen. What's the worst thing they did? They stole the ship. Think about everything that came out of destroying that ship. You, you spend the emphasis of time of being like, look at the wrong you did, as opposed to being like, well, you accidentally created this planet. Then you made sure to protect this planet, and then it accidentally blew up. So, like, you're kind of working with the Starfleet orders of, like, making sure that, like, nobody, like, goes a rogue on a certain planet and makes them all, like, some, like, you know, something that shouldn't be wanted. And, and then after that, it's just like, after that, it's just like, there's a resurrection of light for the first time in history. And we're in the 23rd century. So this is like two centuries from now, life comes back. And you're just not like, we're going to still focus on your bad do doings instead of being like, you made Spock come back to life. Like that's it's incredible. Can, 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 we, can we just sit down and really talk about this and tell us how this works and what a Genesis played in all this? But no, it's you stole our stove. Starfleet ship. A lot of a lot, a lot of Starfleet red tape and bureaucracy crap. Okay, buddy. That's that's what you're getting at Starfleet. Hold me back. It's like you stole your dad's car. Yeah, because I had to drop our mom off because she was giving birth. But no, you stole the car. It's just like, but did you hear the rest of that story? <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure stuff like that has actually happened in real, real life. Okay. <laughs> So on the way on the way back, that's when they encountered the, the not when they encountered, but they get the distress signal from Earth saying to go not to come to Earth because a large unknown probe is yeah. hovering over Earth, just making this very large thrumming sound that was very um very sing songy. And what did you think about that sound? Because it kind of like if I was there and I was hearing that just omnipotent sound around all of earth i would i would think it was end of days um uh, you know i'll put it this way the sound was quite unique and i mean that in the most loving way yeah but what i found more odd is just like how it was the most unimaginative spaceship you can imagine it was a black rod with like a <laughs> dingleberry like it was just like Okay, like, like, they, like, I seen a lot of spaceships out of uh, Star, uh, Star Trek, but uh, this one seems a little bit lazy. <laughs> I think that's, I think that was really what they were going for was the whole simplicity of it, and hoping that the simplicity of it would just be enough. I mean, it was, it was enough at the end of the day, but like when I just kind of look at everything that came before it and all that stuff, I'm just like. Dude, the crew is operating with a bird of prey here, and you're just giving me a black stick. Like, let's come on, let's let's get a little, let's get come on, let's think outside two dimensionally. Let's get three dimensional here. Let's blow Khan's mind. <laughs> oh, oh my it's... gosh. Anyway, so so I, now, let me ask you something. When you first heard these sounds, you instinctively knew they were like whale sounds? Um, I could, I, I, I thought it was pretty subtle. I, I mean, I heard it. Okay. Did you like how it almost felt like Harry Potter in a way? 
like I like did you ever notice did you ever watch the Harry Potter film where they have like the like the the Olympics of wizardry right yeah the goblet and, of fire yeah and 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 Harry Potter's got this thing that makes a loud screeching sound but it right. only could be sound perfectly underwater water yeah yeah and then the Star Trek crew like oh is like you know we don't know how to identify this wait a second if you kind of make it sound like it's underwater then it comes out crystal clear like I kind of like that's kind of where my head was at. I was just like, yeah, oh, well, interesting. Because the the deduction that because they deduced that it was being targeted mainly at the ocean, so then they just went with, all right, well, why don't we just assimilate it being underwater with this amount of salt present in yeah. the in the water, and then that's the sound that came out. Which it's, spot- it's fascinating. <laughs> it. Was. I don't know. I find that fascinating. I'm just I like, thought oh, it was. That's how you- find sound great it's one of the things that i liked about this movie because it was very that's what made it very much us to that's what made it feel like a star trek episode it's a star yes. trek movie but it, it felt like a, like very much a star trek episode with here's the situation and it's up to start it's up to the end the crew of the enterprise to figure out what the fuck is going on so they can solve that issue what's and the it also resolution? makes it more viable you're like okay the you like you're working for me to buy this, and because you put the effort in, it's like I, mm. I will accept this because it's all logical, <laughs> and I love it. Like I love what's going on throughout this whole movie. I mean, like you get a scene, you get a scene, like it's beautiful. Everybody got a scene. Everybody, anyway. everybody got a scene. So they travel back in time to uh, the year 1986 of the 20th century because that is where they can find the last known of humpback whales. Yes. I mean, they now, could have gone further back than that, but they didn't. Can we talk about the time travel scene? Yeah, of course. Go for it. Do it. Hit me up. The, fa- Hit- All right. the fact that you have to go around the sun at like, a, a, like, it's just like you have to loop around the sun. And if you go at this certain angle at this specific time, it's like it will shoot you back to 1985. But... When you get shot back to 1985, you're going to see all these CGI heads of like every crew member just popping up along the way. What an LSD trip. (laughs) Or LDS. Or LDS. (laughs) Latter-day Saints. (laughs) (laughs) Fucking bad. Fantastic. I I, I, I think it's... and, And... do you find it a little funny how one year after Back to the Future, they kind of go on their own little time adventure cruise? Yeah, I did find that really funny. They go back to the year that, you know, Marty McFly is from, the era of Marty McFly. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Nicholas Meyer came out with the film the same year that the motion picture came out. And it was called like uh, Time After Work or Work After Time. And time After based- Time? Was it time after time? Maybe. Or the day? Oh no, it's the day after. The day after day came after out time? in it. Day after? No, the day after it came out in eighty six. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then it was Nicholas Meyer's like time travel film about like I think it was like uh, uh, Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper and H. G. Wells. I time. Time after time came out in seventy nine. Yeah, seventy nine. The same year as Motion Picture. Yeah, okay, yeah, I see what you're saying now. I, I misunderstood you. Now I understand. Yeah, the day after it came out in 83, so I was wrong on both counts. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. We're, I, we're, I, we're talking here. We're having fun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, but I just find it amazing. Like, they were like, hey, we got to, like, fit time travel in here. Let's, Nicholas, come back. We'll give you $5 million. And he's like, okay, what problems do we have again? Oh, don't worry about it. You got this. I'll take care of the beginning. I'll take care of the end. I'll make this seem like a nice time travel they were like perfect <laughs> it pays off really well and then uh harv bennett and me uh harv bennett worked on the whole uh part and where they're in modern times of 1986 and those were just some of the that was those are just some really great things because then I, I you know i've heard from my roommate about how in the 23rd century they don't use currency yeah and so that's was something they said in this month ago. Like we don't have money where we're from. Like no, it's a hundred. It's a hundred dollars. Kirk paying the bill isn't something that he's. Is that a lie? <laughs> <laughs> um, that that t- t- that's hysterical because like 
one of the most like everyone's a fish out of water in their own way in this yeah. film and i love how Chekhov goes do you know where the like the naval like bases were trying to go for the nuclear like uh, missiles or something like that nuclear vessels the nuclear vessels vessels say and he keeps saying it to an officer and i'm just thinking like it's 1985 He's got a Russian accent. Excellent. I literally He's in America. <laughs> yep. I was literally telling my wife about this yesterday, uh, not yesterday, but when we were watching this movie, I go, yeah. "Oh my god, this is a Russian person going up yeah. to a cop at not the pretty much the peak of the Cold I, War." Yeah, yeah. It's like, do you know where the, the nuclear missiles are? And it's just deadpan looking at him. I'm like, why wasn't he arrested in this scene? I know. <laughs> I know. I was. Th- I thought the same thing too. That comes out later, though, when he is caught on the naval ship. Yeah. And he's brought yeah. into questioning because then they think of him as being a, uh, as a Russian spy with his gizmos and gadgets and whatnot. <laughs> oh man. I, yeah. I love. I love that. But anyway, <laughs> so yeah, so they get on Earth. They're yeah. they're looking for a whale. Yep, they have to look for whales. They all split up into different three different teams. Yes. One to uh, find a way of casing the the whales and the water. The second thing. So who was that? That was Bones and Scotty. That was, that was Bones and Scotty, and uh, Takei. Ohura and uh, Ohura and Chekhov had to find a nuclear fish, a nuclear source to power up yeah. the engines, and then of course Spock and Kirk were looking for the whales. Yeah. And they have some great bromance chemistry going on. Oh, there was the great film. bromance. It's bromantic. What are you talking about? It was very bromantic. Like any time, like that bus scene becomes very comp. Like has different ranges of like fe- emotional feeling throughout s- at so many points. Like it starts off funny, and then it starts off with like going into the next thing where like Kirk is frustrated. He's like, "Why don't you just call me Jim? I'm your friend. Call me Jim." And he's just like, "No, I don't compute like that just yet." And then after that, they start talking about the mission. You could just see the longing in his face, Kirk's face, about like wanting his friend back. And then the other one's just like, "What am I supposed to do on this planet again? Like, how are we supposed to act? Like, what's going on here?" And it just it just plays out like in so many different ranges, but yet it works like like a like a joke. It just it all hits on the proper beat, right? Like the timing and execution is just so well done in this film. And again. Like, because of those little things adding up, that's what makes the pacing of this film so much better. So good. And I mean, the movie definitely focuses a lot on, once again, on Kirk and Spock. But the, the, the side stories that you get with Uhura and Chekhov and then Takei and Scott and Bones are just some great, great, great scenes. Like you said, that part with Uhura and Chekhov asking where the nuclear vessels are at. Excuse me, do you know where the... <laughs> and Ohura's like, I, I, I guess I'm with this guy. <laughs> and there's like, it's over there. Or like, well, that's what we want to know. Where is that? Yeah. We want to know where that is that. We don't know. You know, the, like prior to that, when they're when they first get there and they needed to get money, they needed to figure out like, oh, we need money. And as they're walking. They, they kind of just cross this street without, they just cross this street and they almost get hit by a car. The guy slams on his brakes and tells him, you know, he curses at him. And then so, you know, Kirk has to curse at him back because he has to like blend in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, right back at you. <laughs> double, th- double damn you. And it's double, like, you. what? Who says that? <laughs> well, no, we'll damn you. Double damn you. you yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was and I'm like, you're, you're put off guard, but at the same time, you're like, eh, it works. <laughs> he can get away with it it did it played out so it played out so funny if when i watched it and then you know um i think the scene where they get the money like yeah. I, I really like i think there's one really sweet scene in this whole movie i think there's a glass? lot of sweet scene but i think the glasses is a big <laughs> metaphor of the trilogy of these last three films Right, it's like in Wrath of Khan, you're 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 seeing him sulking because he's sit up in an office watching people fail at this one test, and like all he wants to do is just go out there and play in a starship again. 
and like and and but he's also he's got to admit that he's getting old because he needs these glasses i mean at one point he needs to read his glasses and are at the con but he makes sure that con never sees him read it right and like and and like it kind of like it gets slowly mentioned again in like the third one but not really but seeing it get sold off at the pawn shop <laughs> is like very bittersweet because with, with, like it's essentially him saying like I don't need these things anymore. I'm still rocking and rolling from what I thought I did in two films prior. And then after that, they're like, what can I get for this? And it's like a hundred bucks. And I'm sure a hundred bucks in 1985 or 86 is a lot of money, or at least it had a good value. Like you could get a lot for a hundred bucks, right? right. It's a lot of bubble gum, right? But like at the same time, it, it, he's like, fine, a hundred dollars. Like it, the price means nothing to him because it's a journey in itself. And I feel like he kind of had a resurrection about continuing on and like really striking at every opportunity while he can. Yeah. And I mean, that's, yeah, no, I see. Yeah. Very well said, sir. Very well said. (laughs) Those, those, those glasses. And then he has to sell them off. And then he tells Spock that, well, that's the beauty. I'm going to get him again. Yeah. (laughs) It's the gift that keeps on giving. (laughs) It's like, I literally, literally, I I gave him away in 86. 200 years, they'll be mine again. Yeah. (laughs) It's okay. I'll get them back. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it'd be really great is that we could, just for a moment, if we could think this, is that the glasses that Kirk gets from McCoy is actually the ones he dropped off at the pawn shop. Yeah. Like, that's pretty cool. Like, it just keeps going in circles. It's a... The details in this movie. There's, like, a really interesting continuity in this movie. There's, like, small little... Just small little continuities like that that kept carrying over from the previous films. I thought it was just, like, a nice little little touch. Yeah, yeah. And if you focus and you follow along, like, you get a little bit more out of the film. If you're just following along, you're going to be entertained by the film definitely most most definitely and there was this very and it, and th- this is the other thing there were so many comedic very comedic scenes or her and check off with the cop was hilarious but when you have um scotty and bones with they went to the plastic uh the plastic place yeah and that whole yeah. scene with the computer was just fantastic it was just so funny but even the it- the build up to it. It's like it like how McCoy sells like Scotty is like this person who knows it all about plexiglass, plexiglass. And like they're here because it's like it like this was supposed to be scheduled. He's an important person. And then you see Scotty like finally picking up on the pieces of what needs to go on here. And then he starts getting all dramatic and he's just like, Yes, I am upset. Why don't you know who I am? I was supposed to be here today. And McCoy's like, all right, calm it down. Let's just go to the next day. He's like, yeah, yeah, okay, show me the place. What do you got to offer? <laughs> and meanwhile, the guy's got a button that says, I quit smoking. I know. I saw, I noticed that too. He had a button that said, I quit smoking. <laughs> oh, man. You picked a bad time to quit smoking. You picked a great time to quit smoking. He's going to become a jillionaire for one inch aluminum plastic. I know transparent aluminum transparent aluminum My yeah apologies. that's that's I've what he comes up with science that's what he comes up with and then um the doctor uh what was her name jillian yes yes jillian oh you mean uh catherine hicks's character jillian. yeah dr taylor so they meet up with her who gives them this whole background about the humpback whales and the and then all the the scene. great exposition scene it was to, to fill you in on what was happening with the whaling industry and mm. the part where they go down and to see the tank, to see the humpback whales, which by the way, did you know that a lot of animal right activist group had a problem with this movie because they thought those were real humpback whales that they used? That just shows how great the practical effects were. The practical effects of this movie were fantastic. And they it, it's still, you know, it's been said that that no one can match what that team was able to accomplish with those remote controlled whales that they made. No fooling. Because they were the uncanniness of it. Cause I thought they used real whales myself. Same. I go, no. And I went, 
no, no, no. There's no way they use real whales. There's no way. It's just like to have two, first of all, to capture two humpback whales, let alone one, and then put it in a soundstage. That's. Th- do you think you're Tim Burton? Is this Batman Returns? This. Do you think? Tw- do you think your twenty-one million dollars went? I, I will guarantee you that that alone is fifteen million dollars. <laughs> oh Jesus, man! <laughs> to do all that to get at least one humpback whale that you have to first find, capture it in a tank and like, airlift it with a bunch of helicopters to to come, you know, to lift yeah, all that yeah. weight. And then bring it back to a soundstage in fucking Paramount Cal- in California. No, no, that's at least $15 million right there, buddy. And, but that scene where they're in the tank and they're looking at the humpback whales and Leonard Nimoy, uh, Spock comes in to mind meld with, with, the, with the whale. But that scene where Kirk notices it right away and there's just this great, like, He's doing these gestures that he's going, oh no. Like what his is facial fun? reactions are solid. It's so good. It, is, it was so comedic. He was doing these expressions. He was he had his hands up at one point. He's like, oh my goodness, Spock is in the tank. He's gonna get us kicked out. But everybody else is cool about it. They're like, yeah, man floating in a tank. And, and like part of me was like, yeah, this would be cool because like you see that stuff go on in like SeaWorld. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, any uh, yeah, at an aquarium, anything. You're right. That you would yeah. just there be someone that di- that is diving in. You, you that probably works there. You just went. He yeah. always probably works there. He seems like, to. Man, that guy could really hold his breath. But yeah, he works there. Yeah, he could really hold his breath, and he's really down there, and he's really, he's really, he's really close to that whale. <laughs> Keep that rosé in, buddy. Oh, I am. That 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 took a lot out of me, though. <laughs> oh my god yeah that was and then but dr jillian's character who was just so attached to these to these humpback whales was just i thought in itself was comedic i just kept thinking lady do you got nothing else going in your life right now no and do you know how committed she is to these whales how committed is she to these whales spencer i'm glad you asked (laughs) beyond she's so committed to these whales if you watch closely, her license plate says whale lover. Damn it. You beat me to it. <laughs> I was saving that and you beat me to it. You son of a bitch. Hey, I loved it to you, buddy. You did. <laughs> Damn it. You did. Yeah. she. I, it's funny how they set her up to be this. They set her up to be this whole I'm obsessed with whales. These whales are my whole life. It's like her, it's like her whole dimension of a character. But yeah. you, you, and you gotta hand it to the actress because even though the character was pretty one-dimensional, yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she sold it, it all the way. She sold it all the way, man. <laughs> she had, like, I don't know what she did better. Given the exposition about the whales and being pissed off that Spock was in the water, or her like three-way like pickup truck ride to to, to the birds of prey ship. Because that that scene alone is just dynamite on everybody's performance there. I don't know. What about the part when she's at the bird of prey and she has to do all this space work? <laughs> she's doing all this space work, yeah. miming that there's something there hitting it and going, Kirk, yeah. Kirk, Admiral, Admiral, they touched the whales. They t- She's doing this all. I'm like, I'm look, I'm watching that scene, going, "This is phenomenal space work." I really do believe she's, <laughs> she's banging on an invisible ship right now. Oh my god! Yeah, and they're like, and like, anytime when they need like, like having Spock lie is not nothing that you could do, and, and then like the cut, like the way Sp- the way Kirk works up a date with this woman, Doctor Doctor Gillian, is truly impressive. And like it's impressive because it's like a large joke. It's like you have the worst wingman in the world with you while you're trying to like finesse this person into getting their whales, but like obviously he's gonna work in a date within it too. And he's just like, yeah, my buddy over here, don't mind him. He's had a lot of bad LS LDS in the 60s. That, and she's okay. just like, oh, okay, I got it. 
And then you just see the ride. And then it's just like, he's got to decipher what he's saying to her. And then he's trying to cover up everything. And he's just like, why don't we just do dinner? And then somehow they work out an Italian dinner. Like, like Kirk is like impressively, like impressive to watch picking up at a woman. But when it comes time to pay the bill, don't expect him to be there. Yeah, he makes her pay for dinner, which that was just a very, that was a very- Two funny. Michelos, two special pizzas. <laughs> it's like, I need you to take care of this. I, I don't, I don't see- I don't that. know what you're talking about. I just I miss, had the breadsticks. I misplaced my wallet. <laughs> I had it with I have me. a room dedicated to like old history money and it's there in the 23rd century. Pay for this. When we get back on my ship, I'll pay it back later. <laughs> That's right. When he had to just reveal to her, look, we're pressed for time, which I still think it was really funny because if you're time traveling, <laughs> you're not really a rush when you're back in 1986. When you think about it, you got 200 years to make this go right. Yeah. I just yeah. thought it was, they kept treating it as a, we only have 24 hours to make this work, but I think it had something to do with the. We only have 10 days to film in San Francisco. That or it, it might have had something to do with how the way they had to traject themselves around the sun again might have been, you know, if it went a day later, then all they can do is come a day later. And maybe that's why, you know, if I had to, if you really had to think about it, that's probably why. Because if it went a whole nother day and they came back, that's yeah. it. They're done. They missed that extra. That now you come back. You're coming back 200 years plus a fucking day. I like that. I like that a lot. That makes that. That's good. Like time travel sense. There you go. There, there you go. I, I I fixed it for you. I explained it. That I exposited it. Leon with the facts and info. People, if you're listening, don't miss the name. Don't miss the facts that he's dropping. Write it Damn. down. <laughs> right there boom and red boom. In, red on flesh because i cut myself oh jesus you all right <laughs> yeah i'm good no, I'll don't, don't, don't go all start on me now <laughs> and sing like jonathan da- davis from corn <laughs> <laughs> oh how much i would love to give you a high five right now <laughs> i know I, I don't i don't want your delta new york COVID. i don't i'm already dealing with florida yeah, you got your own Florida code. <laughs> oh my god. So then uh when they had to get the whale when they had to finally get the whales back. Yeah. I thought I thought that was a great scene because they're they're building up all this that was the other thing. They were building up all this tension, like they have to rescue these whales before yeah. they get harpooned. I go, I'm thinking, they're a fucking Klingon warbird from the 23rd century. I think they can I think they can catch up to this thing. But they made it seem like an old ship. They're just like, you start things blowing out the sides of it and stuff yeah. like that. And you're just like, what the hell? And you're like, oh yeah, it's not the Enterprise. <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's very true. It's a, war, it's a Klingon warbird. Seen some days. But then uh, when they, they stop the harpoon and then they're like, and then the ship, you know, decloaks those guys just like freak the fuck out <laughs> you know, like i thought yeah if i was them i wouldn't stay either i mean what do you do when you see something you see this unidentified flying fucking object in your face what are you gonna do all you have are harpoons bro what does it have you don't know you don't know you don't, you don't, you don't know where you're you don't know is. bro you don't if i was a garbage man i would run off too i know i would run off too it's like, what is that noise? What's all this happening? What the hell? I'm out. <laughs> oh boy. And then they come back, dipping the whales into the, you know, they explode the, the whole hull of the ship so the whales yeah. can come out. But in the process, they're basically sinking. They basically are sinking the ship. And then you have that. Scotty and, uh, and uh, Jillian, Jillian get stuck. Which, Jillian, yeah. of course, you know, Kirk has to come over there, you know, swinging his machismo around there to just like, I can pry open going, I can pry open this door. You, Scotty, take the doctor over. Who know, by the way, cheeky girl who said she had nothing jumps on, jumps on his, jumps on Kirk's bones 
and Kirk, knowing that time is of the essence, goes, all right, she's with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's just like, hey, she knows how to speak to the whales. And meanwhile, yeah. we've seen Spock do all the work of talking to the whales at this yeah. point. Like, the only thing we know she's possibly aware of is, like, one of them being pregnant, like the whales. Yeah. And that's about it. And then you're just like, like, Spock could have handled this. Like, Spock, Spock could have been just like, you know, Kirk, this is really bad, and I'll tell you why. I could speak to them. Any Vulcan could speak to these animals. We don't need her. And he would have just been like, oh, shoot, well, I guess you got to go back to your Michelob beer. And it's just like, no, that's not the case. Like, she just fluently just gets on board, and they're just like, we celebrate with this woman. Like, she, she's celebrating on the wing of this ship going down, and she's like, oh, the whales are communicating. The yeah. water comes back. Yeah they're all fist pumping yeah oh yeah i just thought i thought that was great with nichelle nichols when she was like she was fist pumping like yeah go whales kind of like jester <laughs> you know she's got more scenes in this movie but i swear she had a be- she had a better one-off scene in the previous film like she did the previous film she had was a real badass this one it's just like oh you're tagged on to, to you know follow check off to do this or to feel guilty about you know le- at leaving check off behind it's like no, woman, you are a strong, independent person. Like, you kick ass no matter what, all right? Don't make these other people make you feel bad because of this, this, this script you got to read. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. You were kick ass. You were badass in the last film. She really was. Jackie yeah. Brown could have took notes from you. Boom. Pam Greer, baby. Woo! <laughs> Like, you know, like one of the funny things going back with the whole hospital scene, which is one of my favorite scenes in this movie, is that. Oh, let's talk about that. Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. McCoy yes. doing his whole thing, how he's like, yes. he's like, damn it, Jim, we have to rescue Chekhov. We can't leave him yes. in the hands of 20th century medicine, <laughs> which my wife loved that line. She laughs so hard. When he meets that old lady with the with the liver and the kidney or whatever she the has, kidney she, that she had to go kidney. on dialysis, and he goes and he goes dialysis. Truly, what is this is the dark ages. <laughs> <laughs> like Damn it's, it. it's it's tragically comical the way he's perceiving all this, right? And then the fact that to to deal with uh, uh to deal with the the amount of inflate uh in, inflammation in a person's skull to drill it it's horrible it's barbaric you, it's like damn it man he doesn't need holes in the head <laughs> he to, and he you're needs, just yeah yeah go 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 he needs to have he needs to have the, he has to have the artery repair that's all what are you doing <laughs> dude, i i swear he's my he's he, he's turning into one of my favorite characters in this whole franchise i don't see you know i'm only watching i'm still in the first season of tos and I've only seen a few it's the seasons. slowest season. It is. It really is. And so I don't see much of Bones in that. You know, he's he's there. He'll say something to 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 Kirk, whatever, or have a, a quick scene or like yeah. about science, about medical stuff, and boom, it's done. But in these movies, especially in the search for Spock, he was just so good. Yes. And I know what you're talking about. He just he was easily just becoming one of my favorite characters. And I go, I wonder if he was like this in the TV in in, in later episodes of the TV series, because this is fan he he was just doing fantastic work. Well, they really touch upon it, and especially the bickery between Bones and Spock. Not like they're arrivals, but they always did see different things differently. But yeah. they could at least work with each other and, and respect each other's thoughts. And like right. you got you 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 picked up on that in the TV series, but like the see the fact that McCoy was the one who had to have like Spock's brain within him. It was just like, of course that would be the case because that is the complete opposite of Spock right there. Yeah, and I enjoy and like it's highly enjoyable. But I'll say this: when it comes to t- the TOS, the original series, like. By all means, don't go in order. Like, this isn't, like, anything that's, like, continual from the last episode. Like, really, yeah. like, find a title, find a plot that just jives with you. Watch it that way. Because I because I started doing that, and I wound up getting more pleasure out of the series as opposed to just going in order. Right. I, I totally, I get what you're saying. I did the same thing with the first season of uh, Next Gen. I did the same thing with Next Generation in its first season. But then at some point, I just let the episodes play right one after the other. And if I at found some an ep- point you gotta in TNG. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, you're yeah, especially when you get to the se- especially when you get to the third season. Yes, yes. The second season, I think I skipped episodes. I just went, ah, this is this is a filler episode. I think there was one episode we were all watching and we yeah. all just sat there going, This is kind of boring. This just feels like a filler episode. I think they just needed something to show this week. So we just like completely skipped it and went to the next episode, which was significantly better. On the Reddit <laughs> fan base, they were saying like there's like probably like five to seven key episodes to watch in the first season. And then that's it. Like you could kind of ditch the rest and move on. Right. To the Space one. Seed, Dagger of the Mind, I would think. And no, then... no, no, no. TNG, TNG. Oh, and TNG. Okay, okay. I got you. Like TNG, there's like, I mean, there's, and I'm sure the same, same could be said for TOS, but in TNG, it's like there's seven episodes that really do carry on for the rest of the series. Like there's, in the first season, I think there's an episode with the Frange. Mm hmm. Where where it's like the Fringe and the Starfleet have to kind of work together. Yeah, like to find one... a wormhole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the Fringe gets stuck in the wormhole. Yeah. Now, if you were to watch Voyager, they Maybe. come back. Yeah, I yeah, I've heard about that. I've yeah. heard about that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so like go ahead. So there you go. That's like those yeah. are those are like your key episodes. So there's a whole I'm, I'm sure there's a Reddit. I'm sure there's someone that blogged about it already. Um, oh, there's plenty of blogs. Oh, like, yeah. This isn't hard to find. Like, yeah, I'm sure you can even just Google it. Oh, my God. I'm totally going to Google it. I'm totally going to Google it. Oh, boy. So going back to the movie, uh, where, are we at? where are we at currently? We did the whole bone scene, which was just fantastic. We got even skit. We got uh, the victory. We got the victory. We got the, victory. Of the, whales. We the, got vi- the communication of the whales now talking to the ship and the ship's like, Deuces. oh. You love us. We love you. No problem. Here, here, here's your water. Here's everything. We're out of here. You have it. Sorry about that. Take two in the morning and call me. Now, let me ask you something. And this could be like, because I'm having a lot of reaches and thoughts here, because like, I think the time travel has to flip with because of the success of Back to the Future. I think the fact that no ships were destroyed in this film is because of like the Challenger. Like, I think they wanted to keep it as, like, lighthearted and, like, non-reminiscent of what just happened so that, like, it could work better. Well, yeah, because filming of this movie happened in February, so not even a month after the explosion of the sh- of uh, the shuttle. Yeah, they were just like, we can't have it be destroyed, these ships destroyed, we have to just... Might be a little too power, soon. Power loss, end of, end of story. Yeah. You could allow a power loss, and that's it. Yeah, it's a threat. We don't, we don't know how bad of a threat it is, but yeah. right now it powered everything down. But if that adds to the element of how lighthearted this film is, and I mean that in a good way. Right. Like, like I, I, I think there's a lot of elements that came out here that made this movie not the greatest Star Trek film, but probably the most easily rewatchable and then the most any outsider could watch this film and find something they could just kind of dig about it. Especially people like us. Like my, people born in the 80s and stuff like that. Or yeah. the people who lived it throughout the 80s. Like there's a certain element where we could just kind of watch this and enjoy it. Yeah, I yeah, uh, I don't, yeah, I, 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 I completely agree with you. There was a lot of things that I enjoyed about this movie. And one of them happens to be how downtoned it was. How... Mm how not downtown how low-key it was of a movie in terms of it of its intensity compared to the wrath of khan and even the search and, and the search for spock and you know and once again if you think about it the plot is similar to to the to the vidra plot first one yeah yes yes yes, yes. How this unidentified object is heading towards earth and now it's posing this intense situation yes 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 thank you thank you i actually wrote that in my notes but i forgot to add that but yeah no, it's <laughs> the truth. right away no okay. it's the truth it's like it's it's voyager it, it it has all the elements of the first movie but without the the slow pacing or seriousness seriousness to it right exactly and the fact that it was a probe coming towards earth Mm, as right? opposed to a probe in space like yeah that yeah. we sent to space that came back this is just an unknown probe God, and we never yeah. really we never really know what is said between them we just know that the humpback whales respond back the probe goes okay cool here's a water back deuces well you know i i found it incredible that like 
humpbacks were the older species before before uh, uh, humans. Mm -hmm. Okay, and therefore, like the 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 aliens, intergalactic aliens, have been around for so long that like they eventually had some kind of communication with whales or some kind of sea life. And therefore, because of that communication, they were able to, to, to figure out some common ground. And then it's like, well, we have Earth's human beings now. And they're just like, mm -hmm. we don't know this language. We don't know what you're doing, but this isn't right. This isn't, this is all no all day. Where are those people we talked to like 12 minutes ago? Meanwhile, it was like 30 million years later. And then they're just like, here you go. And then they're just like, oh, okay, you guys are still here? Yeah. All right, well, you know, you, I'm glad to see you guys are still here. I'll, take, take care. I'll see you another 20th century. See you in a couple of centuries. Yeah. Hey, uh, I'll be, I'll, do, I'll write. Another I'll 20 write. centuries. Bye. All right. All right, buddy. Don't, don't even worry about it. <laughs> so then uh, what is it? Uh, you know what you talked about, but there were ships destroyed, but they were destroyed off screen. They mentioned two Klingon ships were destroyed by the probe. No fooling. Yeah, they mentioned it in the in near the beginning. Ah, shit, I'm sorry, I, I screwed that. But up. you're but you're right. They didn't show it on screen, but they mention it that it happens off screen. So that that you never saw. So there yeah. was that. There was that. All right. But you go back to the same exact scene where it was mirroring the first scene with the Klingons, but now it's the Enterprise facing up to everything that's happened. But because of what they what they did, they don't get court martialed. Instead, they get demoted back to which Kirk gets demoted back to being a captain, not an admiral, yeah. a captain again. Captain. To to fly to, to captain a starship again, which is what he wanted. What ship again? What ship? He gets. Uh, it was a big surprise. It was the Enterprise. Oh yeah, with the letter A. With the letter A. And then enter, and then TNG has the letter D, D, which shows you the progression of A to D where that went. <laughs> but, but I, oh man, oh man, it's fun to see them get back into the Enterprise and William Shatner or Kirk being like we're home again. Like that's really cool. Again, I think everything that they're court martialed for is complete BS. The fact that you brought somebody back to life is more magnificent than anything else. Um, I, I think they, the earth. I, I, I kind of want to spin off with Catherine Hicks in the science department of like her doing whatever the hell she's doing because it's like I, I like th there's a part of me where I'm right. like I kind of want to hold on to this character and see where she goes next. Right. And I don't think there's much after this, but when no, 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 there's no continuity to her because like they were smart enough to be like, well, let's not do what we do with Savic or any other character. Let's just make sure we dump them by the end of this film. Yeah, and they they really did dump her. Yeah, she's going on a whole other ship. Bye. Yeah, exactly. It's a, and it, and then it's just like, what are you saying in the twenty first century? Uh, can I get your number? <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys say in the twentieth century? Can I get your number? I don't. I don't even. I don't even have your number. <laughs> she's like, don't worry, I'll find you, and which is a great way of saying like. I'm never going to call you again. Bro, okay. <laughs> 23rd century ghosting. Thanks for the great job. Peace. <laughs> Thanks for bringing me into well into the future that no one else from 86 is ever going to experience but me. <laughs> it's like, it's a, she, you know, she's essentially the, the oldest living human being and she's galaxy. got so, she has so much knowledge or for an earth species she's yeah. the longest living human she being. has so much knowledge in her first-hand knowledge that like that alone will just get her an honor an honorary degree from starfleet academy how disappointed do you think she was when she wasn't able to get like a mushroom pepper pizza probably she's gonna like to can i get a mushroom pizza and like a michelo and they're like we have neither of those things and she's like why did I sign up to again? <laughs> Sorry, lady, you're dealing with synthahol and whatever synthetics that we have here to make pizza. Deal with it. <laughs> That's hysterical. And Do so, you at least have breadsticks? I need some breadsticks. And they're like, no, we got nope. no breadsticks. No, sorry, we have gluten-free options only. We have Easy. a Z. 
Yeast became uh, outlawed after like the, you know twenty eight. After the bacteria, after the great because bacteria all the wars. It gave. Yeah. <laughs> after the great bacteria wars and fungal infections of like twenty of twenty of twenty two thirty six, we had to do away with yeast. <laughs> Sorry. The mushrooms Luke. are good. We still got mushrooms. Can I get them on pizza? No, we outlawed fucking pizza. <laughs> that has yeast and mozzarella and you're like wait i can't have oh cheese no no cheese we found out we found out it's bad for the cows you know it's funny because you, you say that but in uh in this in the one show of star trek lower decks they have tacos they show they have oh, shown really? characters eating tacos and not and nachos i'm gonna be honest that's really cool <laughs> you know one of the things that my i watched this movie with my wife while she was doing art yeah. Right. What kind of art? Like finger. Uh, you know, art? like yeah, like crafting, uh, crafting, uh, fake flowers onto like frames. chicken mache and like newspaper not, not mache. with she, cornstarch. What she does is that she'll take a violin and then she'll spray paint it, and then what she'll do is that she'll start to glue on floral pieces around it. Ah, sweet. And so she was featured at an art show y- yesterday, actually. Her, 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 far of, yeah it was so that's cool. why she was so tired yesterday exactly okay she woke okay. up she woke up at 6 37 the morning yesterday to go to walmart to get a bunch of glue sticks so that she could work <laughs> on her art that morning so that's why she was super tired yesterday oh, but that's cool yeah was, does she have an instagram for her yeah it's um Haley wow. makes Haley makes stuff and it's Haley spelled h-a-y-l-e-y h-a-y-l-e-y makes Makes stuff stuff. exactly all one word no underscores no underscores no no underscores thank you (laughs) but i had this movie playing and my and Haley really enjoyed the movie she kept saying this is my favorite movie that you've played so far as star trek oh so she's seen the other three she's caught bits and pieces and every time she was around for it she wasn't into it Mm. um but I, I think for the wrath of khan but yeah she, even for wrath of khan she was i think she was there for about half of the movie and she just wasn't into it but she she's said not for, a fan of shakespeare is she? no she wasn't nor moby dick <laughs> but she watched, <laughs> but she watched this one with me and she kept going this is my favorite one so far i love it <laughs> it like i said it's the easiest one to get somebody to watch you're like you tell them the synopsis is like now nah, i'm off put and then you're like no no trust me and then they watched it and they were going like well, that's you know, cool. That's cool. You could tell oh, that's you- interesting. And then they go, oh, I was born in the 80s. And this is about the, oh, yeah, this is funny. So you can, you can really liken the voyage home as an effect. You can call it the voyage home effect, where if you explain the plot, no one's going to be into it. You can apply no. this to the John Wick movie. What's John Wick about? All right, so it's about this guy whose dog you gets fuck killed. fuck up his dog. And then he wants to go kill dead. the he wants to kill everybody that killed his dog. Yeah. He, uh, when I first heard that synopsis, I went, "What?" <laughs> but I went How much and watched. Do you it. love a dog? I mean, I love my dog, but I don't. It's like I think that's a little much to just go around killing a bunch of people because of a dog. But then you went and you actually watched the movie. You went, "All right, this is a great movie." That's the boy. <laughs> I love your delivery. You're like, okay, this is a great movie. <laughs> that that's that is that is Star Trek for the voyage home. It, hey, it's about them rescuing whales and bringing them back. It's awesome. It's, fucking, it's fucking awesome. You know, it, 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 when I first heard the plot of this movie, I, I mean, I've heard about it before, and it's been pandered or poked at or jabbed at, and and other in other things like TV shows and whatnot, but. I thought to myself, that sounds, I would watch that. All right. Just, just because of like, I want to see if they pull it off. So let me ask you something. Where does this fall in your Star Trek ranking? So Wrath of Khan is still number one. Mm-hmm. I And then The Search for Spock. And then this one and uh, Voyage Home. And then The Motion Picture. Yeah, okay. I, I keep relegating the motion picture down further down as we go, bro, because I go. I hear you. No, no, no. I, uh, I yeah. feel the same. I, I Actually, my ranking is very much on par with your ranking. 
Okay. <laughs> it's it's like Leonard Nimoy managed to do better than Robert Weiss, and Robert Weiss directed fucking West Side Story and edited Citizen Kane. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Can we just talk about that for a second? Just like a hot second. A prestige director was outshined by Leonard Nimoy. Not once, but twice. Three no, times? you're right. Twice, 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 twice. twice, twice. So yeah, no. yeah. Nicholas Meyer did Wrath of Khan. Yeah, you're, right. Wrath of Khan yeah. you're right. There's twice. no way Nicholas. There's no way Leonard Nimoy did the Wrath of Khan and then brought out the other two. I would have been just like, "You're jipping me here. What's going on?" So then, the next movie is the Final Frontier. The final frontier, which number it's five. not the it's not the Fido movie because there's no. one more after that. But this is Star Trek Country. Yeah, that's number six is Undiscovered Country, which was supposed to be a working name for one of the other movies before that, which was the second movie. Which yeah, Wrath of Khan. Supposed to be the Genesis with the Genesis and with the whole time traveling thing to go back to prevent Klingons from assassinating JFK. I still think that would have been a great movie, um, but. I want to know what the beef was with the Klingons. I guess it's because of the space, the space race. Yeah. I mean, that's what essentially is space. They're like, we can't let the Americans have it. So we're going to assassinate JFK. But the Russians, the Russians, they're good. We're going to let them have it. They're going to be our best allies in space. (laughs) I mean, that's how it kind of sounds. Like, that's how it kind of comes off. Am I wrong here? Or is it just me? Yes, you. This is That's you. Me. Can we go with 50-50 then? Okay. Saying, uh, then I'll, give you, no. I'll, I'll give you 60-40. How about that? Okay, 60-40. 60% <laughs> I'm right, 40% it's the other way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. And so now <laughs> this is where oh we boy. go. We have to now boldly go into the final frontier. So can you cue us out with your little space jam? My space jam? Didn't Wait you up. just download a whole bunch of supersonic uh, Star Trek tunes? Yeah, totally. Hold on. Hold on. All right. This is us signing out. Okay. Cap- ah, Captain Spencer here with Lieutenant Leon signing off. <laughs>